thanks very much for um, this opportunity <coughs> to be part of this conference first, of, uh, first and foremost. Uh, the title of my paper is um, An Even Regional Development in Ghana, Does Politics Matter? And I was actually asking this question because if you look at the vast amount of literature on spatial inequality, regional inequality in developing countries, in African countries, it tends to be largely apolitical, dominated by the literature on neoclassical economics, um, arguments concerning issues of geography, the more influential and recent new economic um, geography, which was adopted by the World Development Report 2009 and so on and so forth. So my interest is to show that, um, that politics does indeed also matter in our understanding of this problem and how we can actually go about addressing the problem of spatial inequality in the African context. Now, this is the way I intend to go about the, um, the presentation. I start with a brief background and motivation of the study, the framework that guided my analysis. Then I introduced the case study on Ghana. There is the questions that I address, how I went about addressing those questions, the findings, and a few um, concluding remarks and policy implications of um, the study. Um, if we look just, I mean, just cast our minds back, just a few years back, just from 2000, I mean, one can argue that we've actually witnessed a relative shift from what I mean, Samuel Maxwell referred to as a new, new poverty agenda in the early 2000s to what one may call today a new equity agenda. I mean, when we entered the 21st century, I mean, the, the overarching concern of the international donor community was about how to re reduce absolute poverty in the world. Uh, and there was very little concern ab I mean, about issues of inequality and equity. I mean, a very typical example um, is the Millennium Development Goals, if you just look at the, I mean, the, the, the type of goals that were spelled out. Today we see a significantly different kind of agenda. Um, for example, I mean, we, we see how issues of inclusion and equity are occupying a center stage in the ongoing discussions about um, what a post-2015 development agenda should look like. And within this overall problem of or increasing concern to the problem of inequality, the spatial dimensions of inequality has been of critical concern for a number of reasons. One being that, I mean, already it is a very significant contributor to the overall inequality and, also, and, and it's also rising in many developing countries, according to this very recent evidence. And this is a worrying concern because, I mean, apart from um, the adverse implications of inequality in general for the poverty and uh, growth agenda, the spatial dimensions of inequality can also undermine social and political um, stability. And for Sub-Saharan Africa, this trend towards increasing inequality is quite puzzling. It's very surprising. And, um, this is what um, Branko Milanovic uh, told us, that Africa should be a low inequality continent because African countries are poor and agricultural based, and also because land demand access is widely shared. So he goes on to hypothesize that the surprisingly high level of inequality in sub-Saharan Africa, or in African countries in general, is principally a political phenomenon. But what exactly does this mean? This is the kind of hypothesis that I am interested in exploring um, my paper. And I tried doing so, taking advantage of some new emerging literature on the, on the politics of development, I mean, summed up in the notion of political settlements. And one critical voice I mean, behind this literature is Mushtaq Khan of the University of London, um, who defines um, political settlements as an, inter an interdependent combination of a structure of power and institutions at the level of a society that is mutually compatible and also sustainable in terms of economic and political viability. Political settlements analysis focuses largely um, on three key elements. Powerful elites, interests, and institutions. And the fundamental question being raised, um, as far as this concept is concerned, is how, um, it's, it's about how powerful elites use the power at their disposal in shaping, adjusting, and readjusting institutions in a manner that best serves their interests and the implications of this for resource allocation, the implications of this for policy formulation and implementation, and their impact on development outcomes, both at the national and subnational level. So as far as this literature is concerned, if we ask the question as to why spatial inequalities persist, the answer simply is that Latin regions tend to continue to lag behind simply because, or largely because, they, I mean, they do not have the power to adjust institutions and policy in their own favor. And it's not the only voice behind this kind of uh, emerging literature. I mean, if we, if we just compare the works of Douglas North in the 1990s to his most recent work on violence and social orders, we see as, I mean, a, a certain shift I mean, um, from, from his notion of I mean, the critical role of institutions to looking more closely at the underlying configuration of power that shaped the actual functioning of, of, of institutions themselves. So 
I mean, when I say that there is an emerging consensus, I'm not suggesting that I mean, this literature is homogeneous. In fact, it is very far from homogeneous. But there are a number of converging points among um, the work of Mr. Khan, Douglas, uh, and colleagues. And we've just listened to the presentation um, of, 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 uh, the, on the work of uh, Asimoglu and Robinson in, in, in their work on uh, why nations fail, the, I mean, the important role of inclusive political institutions in shaping development outcomes. One of the convergent points, as far as the literature is concerned, is for us to move away, at least slightly, from the dominant notion of institutions matter. I mean, this was the notion that dominated the 1990s. Institutions matter. If you want to develop, get the institutions right. What this literature is suggesting that we should move beyond that mantra to looking more closely at the role of power in politics in shaping how institutions actually function. In other words, we should move beyond the rules of the game to looking more closely at the actual game within the rules. In fact, the game, never, I mean, the game hardly follows the rules as far as developing an African country uh, in particular um, are concerned. And they suggest the need for us to move beyond institutions because as, um, um, we start can't make the point that if powerful groups are not getting an acceptable distribution of benefits from an institutional structure, they will strive to change it. And they, do, and they often do this either by adjusting formal state institutions in line with their interests or by establishing informal arrangements that sidestep or undermine formal state institutions. The same kind of thinking is very evident in the very influential work um, of uh, Douglas North and colleagues on limited access orders in developing countries. One other convergent point is that I mean, this literature I mean, explains to how, I mean, to ask how rent seeking and patronage dominates the politics of development in both African countries and in developing countries uh, more broadly. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested in applying this type of literature or concept uh, to explain the problem of um, spatial inequality in the, con in the context of Ghana. I mean, a country which is divided into 10 administrative regions. The three regions we see up there, Upper West, Upper East, and Northern, in Ghana are generally referred to as the North, or Northern Ghana, whereas the rest of the seven administrative regions are categorized as uh, part of Southern Ghana. And I find Ghana, I mean, as a particularly interesting case in exploring the political underpinnings of spatial inequality for a number of reasons, political or in terms of politics, we are, I'm, I'm sure each and every one of us have, have, have heard of the notion that Ghana is an emerging democratic developmental state, a model for Africa, and therefore the experiences of Ghana can offer important lessons for the African country, of the, of the, of the African continent as a whole. Economically, Ghana also typically illustrates the African experience where the problem of rising spatial inequality have occurred largely within the context of impressive economic growth and poverty reduction at the national level. I mean, just a few statistics as to what I mean by a north-south divide. The rate of economic growth in the north in Ghana during 1992 to 2006, according to the JLSS data, was only 35% of the south. And during the same period, between 1992 and 2006, whereas the number of four people decreased by some 2.5 million people in the south, increased by some 0.9 million people in the north. So that is the... Um, let me just give you a few more examples of what I mean by a north-south divide or Ghana, or regional inequality in Ghana. This, uh, is uh, given us, um, and this is an incidence of extreme poverty in Ghana according to the most recent GLSS data in 2006. Just look at the national average. And what we are seeing in this picture is that it is only the three northern regions, the northern, upper east, and upper west regions, that have incidences of extreme poverty higher than the national um, average. And compared to a national average of only 18.2% of the national population being categorized as extremely poor, 6.2%. Uh, percent of the population in Greater Accra, we are seeing as much as 79 percent, almost 80 percent of the population in the Upper West region being categorized as extremely poor. So this is the kind of inequality that I'm talking about. If you look at, I mean, data on per capita, I mean per capita income, you see a similar, I mean, as, uh, the, 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 I mean as, an exact trend. Now, I particularly would like you to take notice of these two: Upper East region, Upper West region. Um, the levels of poverty in these regions, because I mean. I'm going to explore a subsequent case study focusing on these two regions, uh, so I would like you to keep, uh, to, to, to keep a notice on that. This is a more dramatic version of the north-south inequality, I mean, which is looking at that inequality at the district, a more disaggregated district level. I mean, this is depicting the 20 poorest and 20 most affluent districts in the south. And what we are seeing here, I mean, I'm using headcount poverty um, as an indicator. We have the 20 poorest all in the north, while the 20 most affluent, I mean, with very low levels of incidence of poverty being uh, concentrated in the south. So, the question, so these are the questions that I'm asking. Why have the four northern regions been excluded from Ghana's recent impressive and poverty reduction, uh, recent impressive growth and poverty reduction records, and what roles do politics and power relations play in understanding uh, this, um, this problem? 
And I try to do so uh, um, by attempting to use the political settlements framework. And this is the way I think, I mean, if you look at the literature, it doesn't, it is not about special inequality. The emerging political settlements concept is not about special inequality. But I'm trying to use the ideas, the dominant ideas in that concept to help explain, I mean, to help us show how it can also help us understand the problem of special inequality in, in, in the African context or in developing countries more broadly. And I think to be able to do that, we need to understand how political power is distributed in society. And this can be measured, I'm suggesting, by the composition of ruling elites, cabinet ministers, deputy ministers, key bureaucratic, uh, key bureaucratic positions in government, and so on and so forth. But it's also important not just to focus on quantity, but also quality. In fact, there's a lot of emerging literature that shows that the inclusion of women in sub-Saharan African countries in political institutions has kind of increased substantially, but their influence on the policy agenda remains very limited. So the politics of development also distinguishes between what is referred to as the politics of representation from the politics of influence. In fact, the fact that you are represented doesn't mean that you have influence. For example, we cannot expect the president or the finance minister to have the same leverage. Um, I mean, if you, have, if, if you have Region A having the Minister for Finance and Economic Planning, and another one, another one having the Deputy Minister for, say, Tourism, you cannot count them as one each. I mean, they are definitely different in terms of how much power they have over how resources are allocated in society. And this goes down to the concept of inner core. I mean, Lehman used the concept of inner core of political power to go beyond the quantity to look more closely at the quality of representation. It is also important to understand within a given context how politics and power relationships, institutions, policy formulation, and their implementation outcomes, as well as the distribution of public resources and how this can be related to the distribution of power um, in society more broadly. So what are my findings? And first of all, I try to understand the spatial distribution of political power in Ghana, focusing on the 2000s. And I gathered um, some data for some 114 names between 2001 to 2008. I mean, those who represent who were in government across the 10 administrative regions um, in Ghana. And what we are seeing here, basically, is that I mean, clearly we can see that every single region had a representation, at least even though they varied quite uh, substantial. But more importantly, if we relate that data to the population shares of the various regions, we see some significant discrepancies with some regions far more represented than others. Those in the positive values are indicating that they were a lot more represented than their population shares, whilst those in the negatives mean that, imply that I mean, their, their levels of representation were much lower than their share in the national population. But this is the more important aspect of, um, of the work that I'm, I'm more interested in. I'd go, I went further to disaggregate that data into the, uh, the, the different um, governmental uh, positions, into cabinet ministry, ministerial positions, deputies, and what are regarded as the inner core of power. Looking at um, the three northern regions, if we focus on deputies, we see clearly that they were a lot more, they were far more, I mean, they were represented a lot more than their shares in the population. And that, that's why we are seeing the, the positive figures there. But if you look at the more influential positions in government, for example, cabinet, for example, the inner core, you look at both the first terms, uh, the, uh, the, the first and second terms of that particular regime that I was looking at, you see the same pattern of um, kind of trend being a lot more represented quite strongly uh, in, uh, among deputy ministers, but significantly underrepresented in the more influential positions in cabinet. But what, why should we, why should we, uh, I mean, why should we bother ourselves with this? And why should we be concerned that um, we have a region being more represented in less influential positions and much less represented in the more influential positions in government. And I think part of the answer lies in the type of political settlement in Ghana. I mean, we start count categories and um, different types of political settlements. And, and Ghana falls within what is referred to as a competitive clientelist political settlement. This is a type of political settlement where pork barrel politics is a huge reality. Um, reality. This is about Ghana. What that means practically, I mean, this is an interview data from cabinet ministers. You see when people have power, they not only appoint their people to strategic positions, but when a decision is to be made and resources to be distributed, they find a way of getting it more to their people. When you are given the opportunity to make a decision and you are in the driver's seat, people tend to benefit their people. So you see, it is the space that you have to operate. That also creates opportunities for you. I mean, there are a lot of, uh, quite a number of Ghanaians in, in this room, and I'm sure they know the kind of politics that prevails uh, in the Ghanaian context. So I try to, I mean, to, to apply this literature this overall um, framework and looking specifically at a particular case study, which is the Millennium Challenge Account on Agricultural Modernization. And these are just some basic facts about the MCA in Ghana. Um, 
The amount involves some 547 million US dollars, and this is in fact the largest bilateral grant in Ghana's political history. The goal was to reduce poverty through economic growth led by agricultural transformation. Through the implementation of three interrelated projects, it is implemented in some 26 districts from the Greater Accra, Ashanti, Northern, Volta, Eastern, and Central regions. But who are the excluded regions? Four regions, and they, included, and they include those highlighted in red. And I'm sure you remember those. I asked you to keep notice about I mean, the poorest regions, the most impoverished and food insecure regions were among those who were excluded from the distribution of um, the resources associated with the Millennium Challenge account. The question I'm asking is why? I mean, why should we have a project that seeks to reduce poverty through economic growth, through agricultural transformation, and so on and so forth, and yet you tend to exclude the most impoverished, the poorest, the, most, I mean, the, the highly food insecure regions where you have over 80%, 90% of the people, are, are in some cases, being largely food insecure, and so on and so forth. If you look at the formal selection criteria according to the MCA official proposal document, they did the selection on the basis of three factors. Rural poverty, agricultural potential of the various districts, and proven success in private sector investment. These were the formal selection criteria of the district. So my interest is to find out whether this formal criteria can actually explain to us why these poorer regions were excluded. So I look at, I mean, I, I explore what I regarded as the policies of the beneficiary selection. And the selection be justified on the basis of rural poverty. Highly questionable. I mean, no, but that cannot be a sustainable claim at all. The top three regions, um, the top two regions, the upper east and upper west, where the incidence of rural poverty as of 2000, 2000, 2003, 2004, where incidence of rural poverty rated between 92 to 99% were the very regions that were excluded from. So you cannot sustain the claim that these beneficial districts were selected on the basis of levels of their, of their uh, incidences of rural poverty. The, the second is agricultural growth potential. I mean, this is a highly questionable claim as well. Those regions, the three northern regions in general, are regarded as the potential food baskets of Ghana. I mean, the food, food crops are largely produced. And in the 1970s, Ghana, export, Ghana became self-sufficient in rice production and indeed exported rice to neighboring countries. And where was this rice produced? It was in the north. Over 80% of that rice was produced in the north. You look at the political party manifestos of the dominant two parties in Ghana, and they refer to these very regions as the potential food baskets of the country. We cannot regard them as lacking the potential for agriculture. So this claim cannot also be sustained as far as my understanding is concerned. Proven success in private sector investments, yes. I mean, if you look at patterns of private sector investments, the north is just nowhere to be found. I mean, much of the investments are, are, are located in the south. But there are questions to be asked, because we know very well that private sector investments are encouraged generally by public, by, by public sector investments in infrastructure. You need to put in the roads. You need to put in the schools and so on and so forth. And yet, if you look at expenditure data across a whole of um, road sector infrastructure and so on and so forth, the, the government at the time launched what it called the, pres the President's Special Initiative. And these projects were meant to facilitate private sector investments uh, in Ghana. And yet these very regions were again excluded from those kind of initiatives. So if you tend to exclude certain regions on the grounds that they do not have sufficient private sector investments, and yet you have not in any case created the necessary condition for facilitating, for facilitating private sector investments in these same regions, then there is an issue there. So as, as far as my understanding is concerned, none of these formal selection criteria can explain to us why these very regions were excluded um, from the Millennium Challenge account. So what are my explanations? How do we understand these targeting errors? I think, first and foremost, the answer lies in the nature of the governing coalition at the time, and the North's exclusion generally from what I consider as the inner core of power. I mean, if you look at the paper I, uh, that is online, um, I highlighted a, some, some kind of power play that went on in Parliament, how Northern political elites tried to resist the exclusion of those regions, how they did not succeed, the kind of explanations um, that were rendered by their dominant southern counterparts, and so on and so forth. And I mean, in, in an interview with one team member of the MCA, he summarized the argument as, the, I, mean, I asked him why these regions were excluded and what was the role of the MCC. The MCC stands for the Millennium Challenge Corporation in the United States because this MCC itself was interested in high value agriculture, I mean, agricultural crops. So I was asking him whether it also played a role 
and, 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 and explaining the exclusion of these regions. And his answer was, the problem wasn't MCC imposing its will on us. Yes, they definitely wanted a good business case. They wanted an economically justifiable program. But the real problem was Ghana. The political leadership here, the political will was lacking. That was indeed the problem. But why was the political will lacking? My second explanation is about the interest of dominant ruler elites. And I, and I, and I explain this larger in terms of the, elect, the electoral calculus of the ruling coalition. I mean, if you look at voting patterns in Ghana, these same regions uh, have historically been opposition regions as far as the ruling uh, party, is, uh, the, I mean, the then ruling party is concerned. They don't vote for the party at all. I mean, in 1996, 2000 elections, the party at the time had no single parliamentary seat in those regions. In other words, those are the very regions that tend not to vote. And I mean, I had a lot, quite a number of quotations from um, um, from key political figures around the time explaining how the role and the role of um, politics played or electoral calculus of dominant elites played a role in explaining the exclusion of these. There is one factor that I, I you probably wouldn't see in the paper. I mean, I, I, I cut some section when I was trying to meet Rachel's uh, yeah. uh, word limit pain. But, but I would just, I would, I would, I would highlight it here and probably incorporate it back into the paper at some point. I think the whole thing cannot be explained by politics. I found the role of ideas and ideology to be critical. Um, um, I will just leave out this quotation, but just focusing on the case of Volta. If we argue that the North or those regions were excluded because they were not voting for the party, you have an issue there because the Volta region is indeed also regarded as the vote, I mean the, 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 the vote bank of the then opposition party. And what I, I tried to find out what happened, and I found the role of ideas and ideology, the ideology of the ruling party, which, was, I mean, which saw the private sector as the engine of growth. There were a whole lot of um, agricultural produ uh, production initiatives going on in the Volta region, upon which the government could build upon in the Volta region, and so on and so forth. And MCC's own interest in horticultural crops also played a role in explaining why the Volta region um, became part of, um, of, the, of, of, of the MCA. So these are some of the conclusions that, I'm drawing, that I have drawn in the paper that achieving inclusive growth and inclusive de development more broad broadly should not be seen purely as a technocratic exercise that only requires good policies. It is, in fact, as much to do, it has as much to do with policy as with politics. And by politics, I'm referring to inter-elite power relations uh, in this concept. We all know that developing countries are characterized by clientless politics, patronage-driven kind of politics. And my argument, basically, is that within that context, um, the political inclusivity the extent and nature of inclusion of marginalized groups is critical to fostering their socioeconomic um, uh, inclusion. And the work of um, Francis Stewart on horizontal inequalities highlight um, this kind of argument in a number of country contexts as well. But there are some two important caveats. One is that, I mean, as far as my finance is concerned, it is not just about whether lagging groups or marginalized groups are included or not, but it is more importantly about the terms and conditions of their inclusion. How are they included? It's a more critical question that we need to be thinking about. The second caveat, I think, is, is the fact that the political inclusion of elites from marginalized groups is not a sufficient, and in fact, in some cases, it may not be a necessary condition for, for addressing their marginality. A lot also depends on the commitment and capacity of both national and subnational elites. Um, I'll leave it here before Rachel sanctions me. Thanks.